of these announcements, but they were on the screen, but I will repeat them. So today, after worship, we're going to have praise band practice here. And on Tuesday night, we're going to have Bible study downstairs in the basement, social distance with masks. And then next Wednesday, not this one, the 19th, we'll have coffee time again in the parking lot. So please join us if you can. And um, let's see, any announcements about worship? I know it looks a little different. If there's any questions you have, please make sure to ask some of the people that were at the doors when you walked in. We will not be doing an offering time. That's one main difference of worship, and the offering plates are in the back. So if you can just drop your offering there before or after worship, it will keep us safer. And we will not be coming forward for a children's time message, but it will be shown on the screen. So we are doing one even though there's not children, but that's okay. It's up for everyone. And my daughter is here. My daughter just moved here, so we're so happy she could be here with worship with us. And I'm so glad to be back into this house of worship for you for the first time with you as your pastor. I hope you have enjoyed some of the worship we have been put together. We have a great reopening team, a great group of people here helping with that, and Oscar has been wonderful. So let us prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs> church this morning on such a beautiful morning. We're excited to be able to worship you in person again. Thank everyone who's here today. And if you're joining online later still, we're glad that you are here as well. 
Please stand and read along with me the call to worship. You call us out of darkness into your glorious light, Father. We welcome your light and search for our hearts and your abundance and to the earth. We are here to worship and praise the Shaker of the heavens and the earth. We praise your majesty, the stand in awe of your love and holiness. Amen. Please be seated. Please join in meditation as uh, Oscar plays number 447, O Jesus, I have promised. Other, to cover our mouths if we 
sneeze, not touch our face, to signal that we are sick, and to wash our hands. Then there are the little less obvious signs, but we can see that they are there to keep us safe. So we have this one. And we have this one. And we have this one. That's not being able to have kids come up front, not singing out loud the song that we worship, all ways to keep us safe right now. So let me read you Hebrews 12.25 from the message. It says, So don't turn a deaf ear to those gracious words. If those who ignored earthly warnings didn't get away with it, what will happen to us if we turn our backs on heavenly warnings? This is saying there are consequences when you don't listen to warnings. To rule to keep everyone safe. It says we won't get away with ignoring warnings here on earth. And we won't get away with it when we ignore God's warnings either. So we need to listen to God's word and his warnings. And remember, they are there to protect us, just like these new rules we have to live by right now. Can you please meditate on the words as Oscar plays the next hymn? My hope is built on nothing less. <laughs> Warning. 
feelings interject in God's grace. Pursue peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and through it many become defiled. See to it that no one becomes like Esau, an immortal and godless person who sold his birthright for a single meal. You know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent even though he sought the blessings with tears. If you have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the heavens vague, then not another word would be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even the animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear, but you have come to the Mount Zion in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are in golden heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteousness made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things. So that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Thank you, Al. Thank you for everyone helping with the worship today, and especially for the real green team making it possible. And the leadership team. Now I must say, I would never have planned to do a message on giving warnings from the Bible on the day of returning to worship. After 20 weeks of not meeting together, can you believe it's been that long? In the meantime, we've had devotionals and sermons and then 16 weeks of some form of online worship. While well, we adapted, and what was planned and done with the help of many people was nice, I must say it's not quite the same as gathering to worship in the house of God. So praise the Lord, we are back, and we will continue to pray that we can be able to continue worshiping here in this place on Sunday mornings. Today also is the halfway point of our walk through the book of Hebrews. If you've missed any or all of the sermons thus far on Hebrews, I just want you to realize the main theme of the book is to know that Jesus is superior to all. It's written for the Jews that were scared of persecution and thinking to go back to Judaism and showing Jesus is superior to Moses, to the angels, to the law, to the temple. Just Jesus is superior. Now this portion of text, not read by Al, but found in Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 12, is probably my least favorite portion of Hebrews to preach on. But so be it, we Christ I word. Why do I say that? Well, these are some tough verses of scripture, in my opinion. In the NRSV, they are titled, The Pearl of Falling Away. 
The first part is sort of like what we heard last week about moving forward from the basics of Christianity, not to stay as baby Christians, but to gain maturity. Then a verse surely used in the Calvinist tradition, what we call double predestination, that if you believe but fell away from faith, that you cannot come back. But does Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, really say that it's impossible for a believer who sins and backslides to be restored? That's debatable. The actual language of the text is nowhere near so conclusive. The writer does not speak of a believer, but rather someone who has been enlightened and was not has only tasted the goodness of God's word and heavenly gift. The individual described here sounds more like a shallow dabbler of the faith rather than a solid, committed Christian. To taste is not to drink deeply. To see the light is not necessarily to walk in the light. It's possible then that the writer of Hebrews is not talking about a backsliding, sliding believer, but he's saying that people who simply just hang around at the periphery of Christianity, without making a firm commitment, can eventually become immune to the motivation to return. Immune to the power of the message. It's so easy to turn away. The basic idea is a bit like what Jesus had to say about the seed that falls on rocky soil. It sprouts immediately in the shallow earth, but withers away as soon as the sun gets hot. From Matthew 13, 5 and 6. I like the way one person worded it. Jesus' blood is grace, and we need to keep partaking in that grace. Keep abiding in him, lest we fail to our own selves. And so in verses 11 and 12, to show diligence so that we do not become sluggish, but are instead imitators of those who inherit the promises. This goes along with us not only in learning from characters in the Bible, but also that we, we need each other. So we have mentors, encouragers, ones that pray for us. We can see how faith has helped others in the community and model after their faith and be blessed as we see they have been blessed. Of course, I'm talking about spiritual blessings. How faith has brought someone peace, or comfort, hope, or joy, even in the midst of this crazy thing we call life, with all of its ups and downs. Christians are not immune to them, so Christian discipleship and testimony are so vital. This is what's being exhorted to me. The author wants us to stay with other believers. This notion is used in coaching for success, sports. Surround yourself with the winners, they say. A model Christian may not seem like an entrepreneurial success or a star athlete. They may not measure up to the world's ideals of success. But we know better when we look with our spiritual eyes. These verses can remind me of the addict also who's told you know you never know if you, you'll make it back if you go out. Meaning choose to be active in their addiction, they may either go to jail, wind up dead, or in a hospital or psychiatric ward. Yet they still have a chance to return, if that be the case. This reminds me of them, so, sorry, if, if they only went to the hospital or jail, right, they have a chance, but sometimes it is death that they need to be scared of. This reminds me of them because if we fall away from our faith, we may end up in some sin or some state of mind that keeps us thinking we're unworthy of God's love or grace. I really think that's one of the largest obstacles to people coming to the throne of God. They think they're not worthy. If we fall away and do not get a chance to come back, whether that be due to addiction, despair, 
whatever, we don't get a chance to obtain the everlasting mercy afforded to us by the love of Jesus. I know God would take anyone back. I just know that in my heart. Look at Jonah. Why was he afraid of following God and preaching to Nineveh? He thought they were too wicked for God to give mercy to. He didn't think they deserved God's forgiveness or grace. But he knew that he would give it to them. Look at the prodigal son, the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Scripture tells us over and over again that the grace of God is so tremendous, more than we can imagine. And so I have no doubt that we always have a chance to repent and be back into God's grace. But see, if we spiral out of control, or somehow we never get a chance to come back to the feet of Jesus, to receive his love and mercy, I think that's what this passage is about. Now we come to the passage found in chapter 12 of Hebrews that Al before the beginning read before the beginning of the sermon. The rest of chapter 12 will be covered in a month or so when we discuss perseverance. But that gives us a context. And chapter 11 is about the faith of heroes, which will also be covered in a later section. We have the holiness of Jesus as our covering, and we're always able to come back to his presence. And so this is telling us what we should do so that we do have Jesus as a covering. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. First, pursue peace. It's not something we're just granted. It's something we must work for. We can think of this in our personal lives, where we must work to get peace. We're so bombarded with images, things to do, listen to, read. We have to really work at it nowadays to get time away from these things, don't we? To find some peace, some quiet. We discussed this in Bible study a little bit, that this is the best way to have a relationship with Jesus, to become still, empty, and quiet ourselves. And it's so hard in this world. And that includes our racing minds. We can also think of this as in the world. The Koine Greek word used in the Bible is Irene, which has several meanings. It can mean to reconcile, to be at peace, or to make peace. You remember the Beatitudes, Jesus states in Matthew 5:9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers, or the peaceful ones, right? The peacemakers. He's literally telling us this is not something that happens by chance. We have to work at it. We don't reconcile with others without work. We don't make peace at all without working towards it. In the Latino culture, peace and justice are mostly synonymous. Surely if we work for justice, we are being peacemakers. And we have to pursue this. This Greek word is diapo. It means to aggressively chase like a hunter after a catch. And holiness, and that is to become more Christ-like to me. Again, something we must continually work at. But thankfully, the Spirit allows this to take place despite ourselves. Now, the next part, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up, that troubles Define that brings trouble and defiles others. Bitterness bringing trouble and a root. But what is a root? A root is a source, right? It lays underneath, under the surface. Roots do not make themselves known, but they're a source of nutrition or fuel or other things <coughs> that are bringing to the surface what they need. You don't usually see a plant showing off its root system, but if the plant didn't have the root system, it wouldn't survive. Where do, where do roots dwell? Underneath, no one sees them. But at the same time, 
When someone's bitter inside, you may not see it. It's hidden, it lies underneath the surface, but it can spring up as anger or other negative emotions against others or circumstances. It's fueling something on the surface like roots do. Now I think this passage is not saying that we're defiling others or going against God's will when we seek to find the good trouble just mentioned, like that of John Lewis talks about, when we stand up to injustice. That's different. This is something that's bitter and causing resentment in us. It can happen due to a horrible experience in a person's life, like rape or molestation. Many people bury the pain, but it fuels their actions and thoughts for years to come. The bitterness left from an atrocity as this must be brought out to the light, dealt with professionally, and overcome some of those negative things. Other traumas can bring bitterness too. So it's important that we deal with pain. Think of serial killers or multiple personality disorders or sociopaths. It's almost bound to be the case in all of these people that they were abused horribly and they didn't get the professional help they needed. So these are extreme cases, I know. But think bitterness can be much more insidious also, can't it? And it can affect our daily lives, our relationships, and even in the life of Christ, the church. And the bride of Christ, the church. Ephesians 4.26 tells us not to sin when we are angry and to not let the sun go down on our anger. Maybe this is due to this. So that the bitterness doesn't get buried, building resentment. And I dare say this does happen in the church. It leads to people not returning to our bodies of faith. We don't always like to deal with conflict in healthy ways. It can affect our marriages or other relationships. We need to talk things out if we are angry or we feel hurt. In all things, we need to make sure we are letting each other be heard and valued so that resentment doesn't spring up. Anger can come in unexpected times with resentment and is usually misconstrued or angry at the wrong people or situations, and it surely doesn't bring about reconciliation. Sometimes we need to compromise, or sometimes we just need to agree that we don't agree and move on, because this can be a resolution. Sometimes we need to be, let, be repentant for letting resentment take hold of us, because it can be like a poison. I think this is important to the Church of the Brethren at this time. I don't know how much you follow the denominational news, so forgive me if you already know these things. But I think it's important for us to keep abreast, especially given us being an open and affirming faith community. Late last year, some denominational leaders and those in BRF met and began forming a new denomination the Covenant Brethren Church. This was in response to them not accepting the direction that leadership was going and not forcing people to change their biblical and faithful views. For not allowing people to have differing opinions on the issues of homosexuality and biblical interpretation. They also cite biblical authority, but I would argue that literal biblical interpretation is what they want to adhere to, theologically and in practice. They said churches would soon be leaving this Church of the Brethren, so they wanted to create this denomination so that other churches would have a way to stay brethren. This was highly contentious, as some of these leaders were DEs for the Church of the Brethren and holding positions essentially in both denominations, 
And then a few weeks ago at the Southeastern District Conference, 19 of the 42 churches decided to withdraw from the Church of the Brethren. This was in the denominational news line and can be found on the Brethren Org website dated August 1st, if you have not read it. Most of the churches were in Tennessee and a few from other states in that district. And it's unclear really how many of them are going to join the Covenant Brethren Church. But two days later, an article was published in Christianity Today titled Brother Against Brethren, LGBT Fight Divides Peace Church. It mentioned that 40 of the 1,000 Church of the Brethren congregations were part of the Supportive Communities Network, and that it had not been punished for expelling. They also mentioned the pa pastor of Wildwood Gathering, who just graduated seminary, and I had went to seminary with, and she is a lesbian. She was licensed by her district, Pacific Northwest, years ago, and this has been a huge issue in the denomination. So why do I bring this up? I don't want us to respond with bitterness. Even if things get more heated, and they know most definitely will, on this debate as time goes on, we have made a stance based on our faith and what we believe is right. And that should be all there is to it. We don't want to be an issue we don't want it to be an issue that we think we're better than them, or even take the us versus them attitude in my opinion, as we're not trying to force anyone to changing their beliefs, and we're not saying they're not Christian if they hold their beliefs. Just to hold on to what our beliefs are, and I will say I'm truly blessed to be able to be here in this church where I can preach authentically to my belief that God holds every child as beloved. He doesn't wish for people to not be able to love and be loved because it doesn't fit a literal interpretation of scripture based on changing words, even found in the original text, and twisting ideas of what God says is abhorrent. And I am sure that God does not make mistakes. I hope to delve more into what I just said at a later time, but why do we need to start this kind of trouble with those brothers and sisters with different opinions? We don't need to start that trouble, right? We don't need to because we need to live at peace with everyone. But that is not a good trouble. The good trouble is seeking after justice. We don't want to start fights or divisions. And I'm glad that this side of the aisle has not done so. Now let's look at the text that brings up Esau. This is saying, don't be like Esau, who traded his birthright for a single meal. We live in a sensual culture that tells us to do what pleases us, eat as much as you want, what you want, satisfy your desires. But this is telling us Esau didn't get a chance to repent. His concern was only that he got the blessing, that he benefited. And so even though he sought the blessing with tears, he was not given the blessing. To me, this is a warning about us and real consequences of sin. Sometimes we can't take back those consequences, such as getting an STD due to unprotected sex, or diabetes due to a lifetime of bad health choices, or other things. We can think of masks that protect us, if we choose not to wear them, we are not protecting ourselves or others. And to me, this should not be a divisive issue. Rejections of warnings for an earthly immediate gratification is tough sometimes for us. I think of kids, too, who are ridiculed for their faith in public spaces that take heart 
Jesus is with us even if people are going to persecute us. We're protecting our own salvation by proclaiming Christ, and we're seeing to it that others hear that good news. So God will give us the, the courage, God will give us the words, God will give us the grace when we fail and mess up. He wants you to proclaim not for your glory, but for his, to draw others to him and his love and his blessings. Verses 18 to 24 are saying you have come to know spiritual things, not of this world. Our faith tells us we will be with the angels and God due to a new covenant offered through Christ, which we'll get into when we study Hebrews 8 and 9 in a few weeks. He is again proclaiming Jesus better than and above all things and people. And the rest of this passage tells us to be in reverence, in awe, that we serve a mighty God. He is comparing the fear and terror that God's holiness brought the Israelites to the spiritual mountain, Mount Zion, where angels are joyous, where we are protected by the blood of Jesus due to our faith. So we need to allow others to know that we trust him and his grace. And how do we do that? Well, at this moment in time, in this place, could it be that we allow others to see our belief in true grace and what it looks like to accept all people as a fellow brother or sister in Christ, as God's child, no matter what color they are, what political views they hold, what their sort of sexual orientation or gender identity is. That we wrap our minds around what it truly means to be an open and affirming church, and one who will work towards justice of anyone oppressed, whether it be systematically, through discriminatory practices, through normal conversations even. Like we need to speak up when we hear a racist joke, when someone mocks someone based on what their identity is. We need to express our belief that God loves everyone and we should not judge. That are called to love, to have compassion, and to work for justice. Verse 25 is what Michelle's message was on. And I will say we can look around us at this time and see we must continually look to warnings that God wants us to see here to keep us safe, to show compassion and stop the spread of this virus as much as we can, and to seek the mind of Christ instead of being divisive. You know, until this election, it's going to get much worse with the divisiveness, so let us look to Christ and try not to buy into it. To seek the mind of Christ Look at verses 26 and 27. Yet once more created things will be gone, and what will remain are spiritual things. Amen, right? The consuming fire reminds me of an earlier message I gave you when I first got to Lincoln, as God is a refiner. One commentary I looked at regarding this passage dealt into even when that God is consuming fire on Mount Sinai. But to remember, when he was the consuming fire in the burning bush, it didn't get consumed. He was showing us God's mercy then, his ability to not consume even with his wrath and the covering that Jesus gives us. His mercy and love did not let the bush to be consumed, and it did not consume the people on the mountain either. So we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let us continually give thanks. And when we are shaken by things in this world, and there are many, we need to hang on to the promises of Scripture. 
which we will look at next week in the promises in Hebrews, and search for God's hand, showing us joy, peace, hope, and love. Amen. Now we will listen to a mighty fortress is our God.
lot. Mm. Oh, I know. It's a long time to be in one. Thank you I feel for people who work all day with that on. Oh, my. This is like the longest time we've been on. What's that mean? No, wait. 